The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Stand up with me. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. We're in a series on names of God for you. You know, God calls you a lot of things. He calls you favorite. He calls you beloved. He calls you chosen. He just calls you, calls you to tasks, and calls you to be his soldier, to work on his behalf, his builder, his helper, his messenger. And all of these names we can find through the scripture. And they all inform us about God's posture towards us. That it's a posture of love and care that it's a posture of kindness and mercy. It's a God who roots for us as a dad roots for his kids. But today I want to talk about one of my favorite ones, one that hopefully I exemplify, but not too much. And that is that God calls us a peculiar people. God calls you peculiar. God calls you weird. And that's a good thing. There are lots of people who want to be weird, but nobody is weirder than Portland. Let's start there. Come with me to a city in Oregon called Portland. I've only been there once and it is weird. It's not as weird as you might think, but the people are lovely. But there is this slogan that says, keep Portland weird. And what they mean by that is Portland is a culture of expressionism, individuality, art and weirdness. And it's sort of the weirdness thing that keeps it all together. As long as Portland stays weird, you as a, what would you call it, a Port, Portlander? I'm looking at, you know, nobody knows. A person from Portland, uh, then you will have the freedom in its weirdness to express yourself however you like. Here's some examples of Portland's weirdness. Uh, in lieu of graffiti, Portland chooses to do what's called yarn bombing. That's when you take a public piece of property and you cover it in, in uh, yarn. I love it. I think it's really pretty and, and kind of cute. Basically, it looks like Nickelodeon took over. Oh, and this guy, though. But this guy's great. This is the Unipiper. He's a unicyclist who plays bagpipes that shoot flames out of them while usually dressed up like Darth Vader with a cape. If you're asking why, just read the sign behind him. The why is, we want to stay weird. By the way, the Unipiper changed his outfit for COVID-19. Here you can see him spraying Lysol while wearing a... Okay. Why am I talking about Portland being weird? Because in many ways, you understand why people from Portland want their city to stay weird. They want it to be, my parents lived in, for a long time in a place called Laguna Beach hereby, which is another like kind of artist colony. And it's also a weird place. And you can see how there is this fear that if too much corporate interest or too much business type stuff or too much of these things come in, that there will be an exchange, that in exchange for good things like more jobs and maybe better jobs and a better, maybe even a better economy and more money, we'll lose something special about what makes us Laguna Beach. We'll lose something special about what makes us Portland. And I think that the church would do well to think in those terms sometimes. After all, God does call us a peculiar people, doesn't he? He calls us a weird people. And yet, so often it feels like the church is becoming less and less weird. It's been feeling more and more normal. 
And I'm not sure I'm excited about that. When you look at the early church coming out of Pentecost, when the church was full of the Holy Spirit, it was bizarre. Last week we talked about all of these races and ethnicities and barbarians and Scythian horse riders and Greeks and Gauls and Celts and slaves and all of these people coming into, pouring into the church, loving one another, caring for one another. These are people that weren't even supposed to associate with each other and here they are gathering and loving and caring for one another. The Roman Empire said of the early Christians all sorts of things. They thought they were cannibals because when they would gather, they would eat the body of Christ. They thought they were incestual because husbands and wives would refer to each other as brother and sister. And of course, none of those things are true, but they, 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 the outside world didn't get the inner life of the church. And quite frankly, Peter, the leader of the church, wasn't bothered by that at all. That's why he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, weird, freaky people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I think that the church is always having people within it who are a little bit of the outsiders that are really good for the church. And I want to encourage you in your faith to be a little more like them, to be a little peculiar and a little weird and just be okay with that. It was weird because I think as pastors, we desperately want to reach everyday people. We want to reach normal people. We want to reach people who are accountants and dentists and stay-at-home moms and taxi drivers. We want to reach normal people and show them that this good news, that this gospel is for them. And in that attempt, I think sometimes we as pastors forget that there's also this alluring life in the church that we keep hidden we, we, it's a little light. You know, we keep this little light under the bushel. And I remember before I was a pastor, knowing all of these huge ministries and, and, and you know, I listened to podcasts all the time and, and had favorite authors. And, and, and as I started working at the Crystal Cathedral back when it was doing well and, and it had a lot of influence, as a young man, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of these famous ministers and even now, of course, I especially rub elbows with these guys in various conventions and gatherings and think tanks and stuff all the time. And one of the most surprising things to me was this. You basically can take every preacher, priest, minister, pastor, and you can kind of boil them down into one of three groups. You've got your normal ones. That makes up most of them. You know, the norm, that's the guy that you would hire to run a store. You know, the guy that you would hire to run for office or, or you know, you, he's a responsible chap that can take care of things and you're, you're happy to have him in your Rolodex. But then you have these other two types. The weird one who is hearing things from God or speaking in tongues or, you know, laying in the streets with poor people or saying things that you're like, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. And you've got the grouchy get off my lawn ones, you know, who are always like judging everybody and are always angry and you're never good enough. And it was so interesting to meet the guys from these groups in person, behind doors, without any tapes rolling. And what I found was that the weird ones were my favorites. You know what else was a surprise? Well, first, the weird ones, they were the ones that in person seemed truly full of God. They were the ones that if you were in a corner, you want them praying for you. They were the ones that when they spoke, you really, you really felt like maybe God was, was saying something. Another big surprise was that the grouchy get off my lawn ones were also in many ways seemed to be full of the spirit. 
That was a surprise. You know me, I'm like the, I, I feel like I'm a super nice guy. I, I, I love people. I'm always very positive. I smile a lot. Maybe, maybe I, I don't have a realistic view of myself, but that's how I think of myself anyway. And so I don't always like the grouchy get off my lawn pastors. But in real life, they also seemed full of the spirit in their own way. It was the normal ones that bugged me. It was the famous, influential, normal pastors that something rubbed me wrong about them. And I, I don't want to get into it because there's nothing wrong with being normal, I guess. It just felt like maybe there was this ego. Like there was one guy, a big pastor who was at this table full of people. You know, there were like maybe 12 ministers there and we're eating together. And this guy was like super famous pastor. And he was just like one-upping everybody. Like there was one guy who was talking about a ministry he was doing for the poor. And then this guy would interrupt him and tell him how he did like 10 times as many. And then there was another guy who was like, oh, we do this thing in Israel. And he would say, oh, we do this thing and we do more. And like as he's doing it, he's like eating chicken and it's like getting all over his face and his shirt. Anyway, I, I, I just found that the, the weird, I found that as I get to know Christians, the weirder they are, the more I like them. I don't know if that makes it good or bad, but I'm just saying for me as a believer, I want to be around believers who are peculiar. Maybe you've got people who are like, who look down at you, people who talk bad about you because of your faith. Maybe you don't always feel like you fit in. I want you to know that might be a good thing. I believe that if we take the command of the Shema seriously, which says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If you love the Lord in this way, some people might find you a little odd. In fact, being odd might be evidence that you're doing it right. You look at the women and the men of God throughout the scriptures who chased after God with all their heart. And you find people who are peculiar. People who didn't care about fitting in. Daniel, when an edict is passed that no one should pray, begins praying in his window morning, noon, and night. Wants people to know he's not embarrassed about his faith. Elijah, who runs up and down Mount Carmel and, you know, calls out to God. And John the Baptist, how about him? Covered in the skins of animals, eating locusts and honey. Jesus says to his disciples, when you went out to the wilderness, what did you go to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What did you go to see? Did you go to see a man and dressed in fine clothes? No, that's for kings. You went to see and to find a prophet. And that's who John the Baptist was. An odd cat for sure. I bet if we had John the Baptist here today, he'd probably, we'd probably assign him some kind of mental illness or something. See, the word holy in the Bible means set apart. You want to know why God gives all of those bizarre commands to the Hebrew people and the Torah? Things like don't mix two types of cloth. Like who cares? Who cares if you mix wool and cotton? It's because he wants them to be set apart. He wants them to be different. He wants them to stand out because a light in order to be seen must shine. It can't be hidden. It can't be under a bushel. This is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't know anybody, including myself, when people have gossiped about me, put me down, cursed me, persecuted me, I look in the mirror and I rejoice.
I want you to know, the weirder you are, the more I like you. That's just how it is. The weirder you are, the more I like you. As long as you're not like a mean person, I just love people who live a life so much for God that they're not worried about what other people think about them. And by the way, when you're around people who are not so straight laced, it's easier to relax and be yourself. So I love you. That's all I'm saying. Of course, the most famous story of a peculiar person I think of is the famous story of David dancing naked before the Lord. I'll tell you that story real quick. You know, first of all, David didn't dance naked. We'll get to that in a minute, too. But it begins like this. David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the new, the new capital of Israel, of Judah. He's bringing the Ark. And the Ark of the Covenant, you guys remember the Ark of the Covenant, right? We've all seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Moses puts this together according to the law of the Torah. And it holds three things. It holds the Ten Commandment tablets. It holds the staff of Aaron. And it holds a pot of manna. Wouldn't it be awesome to find that thing? And it is meant to be carried on poles and respected. And the Ark of the Covenant is dangerous, as we also know from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember when we open it and all the Nazis get melted? Close your eyes. Okay. It really is dangerous. It's so full of God's glory that anybody who touches it, you know, touches the actual part, would die. And it's supposed to be carried on these wooden poles, and the Ark itself is supposed to be the throne of God, God the, a picture of God's presence and authority. As they begin to carry the throne of God towards Jerusalem, David has 30,000 men, young men, dancing and celebrating with him. Now, try, picturing 30,000 men is a lot. Staples Center, for example, holds 20,000 people. So just add a 50% to Staples Center. That's how many people are in this procession to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God into Jerusalem. It's this very big deal. And they make a terrible mistake. A guy named Uzzah, because it's hard to carry an ark, puts the ark on a cart. So he sinned, he's broken Torah, the way you're supposed to treat this thing. And so it's bouncing along the road and an ox falls and Uzzah either tries to keep it from falling, but I think the picture actually is more like when you get a cart stuck in a path. Now again, if they were carrying it, this wouldn't be a problem. So the cart is stuck in the path and kind of like when you're pushing like a truck to get it out of the thing, Uzzah maybe leans his shoulder. I'm just, imagine this doesn't actually say this, but it, pick, it says he was trying to get it out. So I picture him like pushing or using his back to kind of, you know, pry God's throne out of this thing. And when it happens, it says God's wrath burned against him and he died right that in, in that instance. Imagine the air going out of the room when this happens. Everybody's celebrating, there's music, there's celebration, it's fun. And then this guy tries to shove the ark out of a, a pothole or something and dies. Someone everybody knows and everybody freaks out and is terrified. David, it says, and this is such a classic thing. David gets angry at God first and then he gets scared. How could you do that to Uzzah, a good man? Yeah, then he gets scared and he says to himself, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He asks himself, maybe the Lord's blessing has left me. Maybe it's over. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you feel like God's blessing has left you. I want you to know it hasn't. God's about to pour out great blessing in your life. And so, and this seems like another classic David move. David decides... To, because he doesn't want to bring it into Jerusalem in case it kills everybody, he picks this guy, Obed-Edom, and decides to put it in his house. And just to see, like, you know, if Obed burns up, then we did the right thing. But if Obed's okay, then maybe we'll bring it into the city. So they leave it at this guy's house. I don't know what that looked like. I guess they just brought it into his house and they just, like, had the Ark of the Covenant in his kitchen or something. Because <laughs> this is in his house. So I don't know what that meant. But, but then... And then it says, after three months, it says that God just immensely blessed this guy, Obed, and his whole household, which in the Old Testament almost always means wealth and health and prosperity and life. And his farms are going well and just things are going well for him. And people are just like 
whoa, Obed is prospering. Obed is blessed. And so David goes, I got to get the ark. Let's go down and get it. And so they go and they get the ark to carry it back in Jerusalem. They're like, God's you know, presence and blessing hasn't left. And this time, David, instead of wearing his kingly outfit and his crown and his robe and looking magisterial and powerful, he wears linens and an ephod, which means he dresses like a priest. And he carries it in a sacred way where there's still music being played and every six feet they sacrifice a fatted calf, which is like the most expensive thing in the world. Every six feet, another sacrifice. And, it's, and they carry it, of course, it's not in a cart. But still, David, dressed up like a, like a priest, is like dancing. It says, it uses almost the same language that we use about loving God. It says he danced with all his might. It was like with everything he had in him, he just danced before the Lord because he was so thrilled that God was with him and for him and that God was coming to Jerusalem and God was going to save and preserve his people. That all he could do was dance like crazy. And everybody's celebrating. And the ark comes into the city and David, you know, in the linens and in a fod and his hair all messed up and sweating everywhere, still dancing, still rejoicing, still singing the halal. His wife, a princess named Michal, looks down from her window at her husband who's supposed to be regal and kingly and dignified and sees a man sweating and dancing and celebrating before the Lord, not naked, but not dressed like a king, but lowly. And she has contempt for him. Her father would have not, never done that. Her father, Saul, who was a regal, handsome, tall king, would have never done something like that. Here's this husband of mine. David establishes the throne of God in the tabernacle and he lays down the sacrifices and he blesses the people and gives them all of these foods and cakes and things. And then he goes up to his own house to bless his children and his wife. And when he enters the house, his wife, with fire in her eyes, says, How the king of Israel distinguishes himself dancing half naked before the servants like a vulgar man. And David's response, he looks at her and he says, God chose me. I will become even more undignified than this. I will be even more humiliated than this. We're the Lord. We need some respectable Christians to let loose a little bit and take the lid off. Look, when I talked this morning about this, I'm not encouraging you to be weird as much as I'm encouraging you to love God so much, to live for him with such fire and such passion and such a desire that you don't care about what other people think. You don't care if other people choose you. You care if God chooses you. And I think it's this thing that is most alluring about our faith is people that are just overflowing with the spirit, overflowing with life and overflowing with love. Don't worry about being weird. Don't worry at all. Just love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and he'll take care of the rest. Father, we love you. We thank you. I pray for everyone who feels like they don't fit in, like they don't belong. I pray, Lord, that they would just continue to seek after you with all their heart. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, friends. We are so happy you've joined us in worship today. 
You are the beloved of God, and we are thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. As we continue celebrating our first 50 years of broadcasting, Hannah and I want to remind you that you are the reason that our mission continues to go around the world. You have provided the inspiration, the hope, the support for like a half century long journey, and this is just the beginning. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Life is unpredictable, but even when we encounter twists and turns on the road, Jesus keeps our feet steady and invites us to fix our eyes on him as he cheers us on from the finish line. God never changes and his brilliance illuminates our path and empowers us to shine his light on those walking in darkness. In a world full of fear and uncertainty, especially with the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic this year, people need to hear the good news that they are not just a number, but that there is a God who knows and loves them and cares for them. Together, you and I can continue delivering that message as we invite our neighbors and the nations to embark on a journey of possibility that embraces God's beloved. As a thank you for your continued support of Hour of Power, we've created something very special, the brand new 50 Years of Hour of Power, commemorating the past, celebrating the present, and commissioning the future coffee table book. This hardcover keepsake features 10 chapters of quotes by Dr. Robert H. and Bobby Schuler, encouraging scriptures, a narrative history of the ministry, historic photos, and beautiful images of nature. Perfect for reading and display, this collectible book is sure to become a treasured part of your library. Quantities are limited, so reach out today to reserve your copy. Call, write, or go online and request the 50 years of Hour of Power, commemorating the past, celebrating the present, and commissioning the future coffee table book. We're asking for your generous gift of $60 or more. Our first 50 years have been a journey, and we're excited to see how God is going to impact the world through this ministry in the next 50 years. My prayer is that you will continue standing with us so we can run our race strong and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is waiting at the finish line. Thank you so much, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.